My name is Dr. Kathy Abbas, and I'd like to welcome all of you people who are here for this uh, exciting event. Uh, we've been at this 25 years, and this is the first time we've been really willing to say we think we're closing in on having the endeavor. This is science. It's not a documentary. It's not something that'll be over in 50 minutes, and we've got a lot more work to do, but we felt that this is the time to share with you where we are. The first speaker tonight, based on the agenda that you all have, is Charlotte Taylor, the State Marine Archaeologist. Hi, everyone. I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the state of Rhode Island, who I'm representing tonight. We're the agency charged with protecting cultural resources, so those shipwrecks out there belong to the state of Rhode Island, and we're doing our best to make sure that the archaeological work on the shipwrecks is as good as it can be. And it's taking a long time because we're not willing to rush the job until we're absolutely sure what we're doing and what we're looking for. So we're really grateful for all the work that RIMAP and the RIMAP volunteers have put into looking for the Endeavor and the other transport ships as well. And we're grateful as well to the assistance of the Australian Mar National Maritime Museum working with us and helping get the work moving forward. And we look forward to what happens next year when everyone comes back to do more work. Thanks so much for coming. Our next speaker is the Honorable Alastair Walton, the Australian Consul General, who's come in specially for this meeting. Alistair. Well, thank, thank you very much. When you say Newport to Australians, people obviously think about the uh, America's Cup and the great jewels that we had between Australia and the United States going for many, many decades. But, uh, but Today, we are sort of announcing that uh, the great piece of Australian history, the location, the endeavour, has actually been found in the United States. So imagine if we said today the Santa Maria had been discovered in Sydney Harbour, you would probably be equally astounded. So this is a result of a lot of work that's been done over the last two and a half decades by the archaeologists, so I want to congratulate. But it's also, I think, a, a, a great symbol of America and, 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 the, and Australia and the United Kingdom, the world's great democracies. So this, this ship uh, that discovered Australia found itself here in the Revolutionary War in the United States, which was a battle for democracy. So I think this is about the uh, great democracy of our country, actually, this story uh, that's been going on now for many, many decades, where is the endeavor? Obviously, people are, um, dotting the I's and crossing the T's, as you'll find today, but uh, I think it's such an exciting time for our country's history and it's a great time to be a Consul General. So thank you very much. Let's uh, be the mic. Well, they've brought a model of the Endeavour, but it's so windy they don't want to put it up for very long, but later they'll put it on the table and you can get some good visuals of that. RIMAP was set up 25 years ago to incorporate the sport diving community into professionally directed marine archaeology programs. Generally, you have to be a university professor or a student or work for a cultural resource management company if you're going to be involved in this kind of work. But we're open to the public and anybody can get involved with us if they go through our training, agree to abide by our protocols. And we had one special guest with us this week as a volunteer. Although he's the C Chief of Navy in the Royal Australian Navy, the Senior Admiral, we made him do exactly what everybody else does. He was wonderful, great fun. And his aide tonight is here, uh, Commander Theobald. Unfortunately, uh, my Chief of Navy, the Vice Admiral Mike Noonan, uh, is unable to be here. He's had to uh, head down to Washington, but he was here for uh, in Newport for the uh, International Sea Power Symposium at uh, the Invite, which was hosted by the US Navy. As a keen diver, the combined Australian National Maritime Museum and RIMAP team invited Chief of Navy to join them on a dive uh, in the following uh, site and this was after his formal engagements. After a 69-minute dive, uh, Rear Admiral Noonan said, correction, Vice Admiral Noonan said, it's difficult to say how much the ship 
is actually left given the amount of silt that has accumulated over the last 240 years. But what he could see was very exciting. He was able to see a number of cannons, exposed timber and what looked like, what looked like ballast piles. He felt extremely privileged to be able to visit and share in such a significant piece of Australia's maritime history. In its day, Endeavour was a modern day equivalent of an Apollo spacecraft. To a Londoner in the 18th century, what James Cook was planned to do and how far he planned to travel would have been almost impossible to comprehend. Ultimately, Cook was one of the world's greatest ocean explorers and Endeavour remains integral to Australia's maritime past. Although the next steps will be determined by the Australian and US authorities with the Australian National Maritime Museum and RIMAP, regardless, this announcement is a significant outcome. On behalf of the Royal Australian Navy and mariners everywhere, bravo Zulu for well done to the Australian National Maritime Museum and their US colleagues from the Rhode Island Marine Archaeological Project. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we're very proud to say that more than 900 people have been involved in this project over the course of the years. And although we've got our professional staff today to talk about how we got to where we are and what the next step needs to be, we don't want to forget all those people who've done so much to get us here. So I'd like to be sure that you understand that we're very grateful to them for everything they've done in the last 25 years. Uh, my part is to talk about how we got here. And uh, if you can see the uh, PowerPoint, I'm just going to speak to some of the images and then we'll have our field supervisor talk about the uh, archaeological activities and then we'll have a discussion from the Australian National Maritime Museum archaeologist who will talk about some of the details to see on the site. How are we going to decide which of these vessels is the Endeavour? Part of it is what happened to her in her history. Where and when was she built? What was the kind of construction that she was, uh, she was made of? What was the size and the form of the ship? Uh, what was wood and the other materials that went into making her? All of those things are important if you're thinking about the endeavor, but also remember that she did a lot after Cook left her. So our theory has always been, yes, Cook is important because he went around the world in the endeavor, but it's those later activities that may be more likely to be found in an archeological site in Newport. So although, yes, we think we might have the endeavor and yes, Cook was important to it, but there's also local histories elsewhere. So Endeavour was originally built in Whitby and sailed in the North Sea as a collier. Uh, she went around the world with Cook, which is what everybody in Australia is interested in. But after she came back to England, she sailed to the Falklands for the Royal Navy, carrying materials for the uh, station there. She was sold out of the Navy to a private owner and was used as a merchant vessel, and he took her to Archangel. During the American Revolution, the need to carry troops to North America to, to fight against the Patriots in, in uh, North America. She was chartered as a transport to carry Hessian troops who were helping the uh, British forces. So all of those activities as she was sailing around the world might have left evidence on the shipwreck that we're looking for. When she came to North America as a troop transport, she was in the fleet that occupied Rhode Island uh, British troops and Hessian troops came and were here for almost three years and one of the tr one of the troop transports was the Lord Sandwich and we now know she was carrying Hessian troops. So is there materials on this site related to the Hessian troops that were on board? While she was here she was also used as a prison ship but there were some local men who were in prisoners who were on board who were important in their own right and that is Captain John Cahoon who was later the commander of the first revenue cutter in the United States and of course the really significant one that we're hoping to find uh, a tool or something like that was John, uh, John Townsend of the great Townsend Goddard uh, Carpenter family and if you know something about colonial uh, 
furniture, it's the most expensive stuff you can buy if you've got a Townsend Goddard piece. So if we find something associated with those people, that helps to prove we have the endeavor. Now, we know that the transports were scuttled in Newport's Outer Harbor, right behind me where I'm sitting, uh, when the French came in to threaten the British uh, in 1778. The transports were scuttled to protect the shores so the French could not come close enough uh, when they uh, banged away with their cannons at the shoreline. And this particular image is a French image that shows where some of the transports were sunk. And if you see there, uh, that that's exactly where we found them. We have the names of the original matrix of 13 different ships. We know what the names of them were, what tonnage they were, where they were built, whether or not they'd been to the South Pacific, more than one of them had been, by the way, uh, whether it had been used as a prison ship and which troops were carried. So this was the first matrix that we had developed to determine what kind of questions can we ask an archaeological site to determine if it could be any one of these vessels. What we're looking for is a combination of materials. We also have a historic chart of Aquidneck Island with Newport Harbor that shows where the transports were sunk. And they're right there by the, um, the, the shoreline protecting the shore and you see the red stars where we're standing right now. Uh, so they're really quite close to shore. But a couple of years ago, further historical research uh, determined that two of the names that we had was incorrect and added two more, uh, the two names were in an, another location. And then we also determined where the ships were actually sunk. So for the first time, we knew that the Lord Sandwich X Endeavor had been sunk in a group of five that were protecting the North Battery, which is slightly to the north of us here. And you can see exactly that this now limits the study area to where we think we might find the endeavor. Now, we had found a number of other sites, uh, but we now know that they could not be that ship. The matrix was amended to now say the transport name, what the tonnage was, where it was built, the date it was built, what troops were on board, and the like. So now we have a matrix to decide which sites are which ships. That's why the data is so important. It turns out that in this five, the biggest one is the Lord Sandwich X Endeavor. So if we find all five and we say that's the biggest one, then it's most likely that that is the endeavor. It still takes proof and we're not there yet, but we're coming close to saying something really exciting tonight. The problem with this is that whether or not the sites are all still there, and what happened after the revolution, or after the British left here, the French came in under Rochambeau and they started taking things up off these shipwrecks. How much damage was done to them by the French? In the 19th and 20th century, the island where we're standing right now had been the Navy's torpedo station. And they were blowing up vessels in the outer harbor, making a lot of debris, and they also found some historic shipwrecks that they thought was a good thing to tear up. So was one of those the endeavor? Well, how are we gonna find them? Everybody thinks marine archeology span is all about the remote sensing and the high tech. That's only about 5% of it, folks. Once you've found a site, then the really hard work begins. But we started looking for this transport fleet in 1993 when we realized that it was significant to the Revolutionary War history and particularly to Rhode Island history. We didn't know at that time that the Endeavor was part of this story. By 1999, though, we had found the documents that said the Lord Sandwich transport that was sunk in this fleet had been the Endeavor. So over the years, we've done many different kinds of remote sensing surveys, and the best one that we had done was by Gary Kozak, and this is the sonar target of the site we're gonna talk about in a few minutes. Well, what's left if you've got a site that's been down for 200 years? The boat goes down, tips over on its side perhaps, 
it starts to rot away, covers over with silt, and so all you've got after 200 and some odd years is just that bottom layer. There's a lot of material that's still there, perhaps a lot of structure as well, and that's what the archaeologist is interested in finding. It turns out that the organic materials above the silt may all disappear, but the inorganics stay there, and the organics that are embedded in the silt, once the silt goes anaerobic and no longer has oxygen, they'll stay in perpetuity. Which means that when we did test excavations early in this process, we were surprised to find artifacts that were wood and textiles, leather, and all of those things that we didn't expect would survive, which is why we're so careful now not to disturb these sites until we have a proper artifact management and storage facility to take care of the materials that will come off of the endeavor. Now, I'd like to introduce Dr. Carrie Lynch, who's going to talk to you about the uh, actual field work that we do. You know, you just push the button. Hi, how are you this evening? My name is uh, Carrie Lynch. I'm a professional archaeologist at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, and I have been volunteering for RIMAP for <clears throat> over 20 years now. Um, I'm going to skip through these slides fairly quickly, but this is a slide of a number of teams that have been with us over the years, some of whom are also professional archaeologists. Many of our volunteers are not. When Kathy talked about remote sensing, this is an image of the 2007 Gary Kozak data. This is the one that really uh, set us in motion and, and gave us the targets to ground truth. So ground truthing is we would go to each one of these uh, little red dots here. We had GPS coordinates. You simply drop a weight with a buoy on it where, where that coordinate is, and then we put divers down and you're really looking with your eyes. It's not the sonar that's going to tell you anything. This sonar, uh, the small, you don't have a pointer, but <clears throat> the sort of beige figure at the uh, lower left probably, that's a sonar target. And I'm sure it doesn't look any more like a shipwreck to you than it does to me. But that is one of our sites. So what we have to do is we have to go and actually get our eyes on it. And we have about five feet of visibility in this bay, and that's on a good day. Um, we had about eight feet this morning, and we were extremely excited about that. That was great visibility. Somebody came by our vessel. How's the visibility? It's great. It's eight feet. You know, they, they thought we were crazy. But we have to go down with that limited visibility and assess where these sonar targets are. What's causing this sonar target? Because clearly it doesn't look like it's a shipwreck. So we have done a number of these sonar targets, and that takes time. It probably took a few field seasons of field work just to uh, examine those targets. We ended up with six ballast piles, and as you can see, a number of modern vessels, a couple of torpedoes, that was kind of cool. Um, a lot of geology out there. There's very, very large boulders, uh, glacial erratics, and they will also show up as a side scan target. So we could drop out on these targets and spend a dive or two only to find geology. And then we come up, we take our notes, and we know we can move on. In the six ballast piles, we felt pretty good about that. That could be uh, part, of the, part of the transport fleet. And our next step was to map them. So we spent time mapping each individual site, only what we can see on the surface. This is not excavation. This is pre-disturbance uh, documentation. And the way you do that is we lay down a perimeter first. So the first thing we have to do is find the southwest corner. Well, where's the southwest corner when you can only see five feet at a time? So even laying a perimeter can take a dive or two, sometimes an entire day. And if by the time you've gone north with your tape measure, it's just a simple tape measure that you use on land and dog screws, they come in very handy. The same thing you would use to tie out your dog. And we screw those in and tie off the zero end of a tape measure and then swim due north, hoping that we've gone far enough to pass the site. Then you turn a little east, oh, no, you're not far enough, you come back, you keep going. You and your compass think you're going north, the current could be pushing you in either direction. So it can take a long time to set what should be a very simple perimeter. Once we've done that, then we mark at three foot intervals with some sort of weight or stake, and we actually tie off those stakes to each other so that we have a grid in place, a visual grid. 
We have east-west running lines and we have north-south running lines. That's another few dives just to tie those things together. So what you're seeing on this graphic here in this Rhode Island 2119 site, if you can see the lines in the background, each one of those are three foot intervals. <clears throat> those three foot intervals are further uh, delineated by a drawing grid that we take down, which is just weighted PVC with string, again, pink, perfect color. We take pink string and we put them at one foot intervals on our drawing grid. And we actually swim around with those grids and we place them down on the site within each one of our stringed off sections. And then we draw what we see. So we, we've done that with all of the sites that we have pretty much targeted as being potential transport sites. Again, that takes a lot of time, pretty much doing about a site a year because it takes a good week or two to get that kind of mapping, and sometimes that's all we have for a field season. Once we've got these, um, these sites mapped, we had nine that we felt pretty confident about were 18th century transports. And uh, this, this image that you're seeing, the yellow dots are the locations of those sites once we had eliminated all those other ground truthing anomalies. We've got the individual site maps that you can see that are uh, indicated, you know, if you follow out your yellow dot there, you'll see all those site maps. So each one of those maps could have been a field season. The reason to do them, they're all at the exact same scale. And the reason we did them this way is because now we can assess orientation of the different rec sites and we can assess size of what we're seeing on the, on the seabed. And you can see the three down at the very southern area are all oriented in the same way. Then you've got the four that are kind of in the middle of this graphic and they're all oriented the same way. And those four are now in our target area. They're right out there, if you can see all those mooring buoys that are out in the bay. <clears throat> and so those are the ones that uh, just three years ago, remember we were looking for 13 up until about 2016, I think. So we were assessing all 13. We had nine, we felt pretty good about that. And then Kathy discovered in 2016 that it was actually within a group of five and we knew where those five were. And we feel we had four of those five. So we were feeling even better about that. After the, the ability to limit our study area to those five vessels, <clears throat> you can see that there is a large gap between three to the south and one to the north. And the 2016 and 2017 field seasons were primarily searching that gap where we did a lot of swimming and saw a lot of nothing. But that's important information. So now we know that there is no other shipwreck there. And at the very end of the 2016 field season, I literally believe it was the last day, I was working with a young volunteer, fabulous teenager, and we went to the west of uh, two of the sites, in between two of the sites, and found a fourth in that grouping. So that could conceivably be our fifth site in this grouping. So last year, actually in this group, it's the, the map over to the left-hand side is that particular site, which we believe is the fifth site possibly. It's very disturbed, so it doesn't look anything like the others. It's not as, as uh, complete as the others. But that doesn't mean it isn't a shipwreck site. It's probably post-deposition is uh, disturbed. So now we feel we have mapped five of the sites where five sites should be. And we're feeling pretty good about that. So which one of these could be Endeavor? Well, remember that Endeavor was the largest vessel out of those five. So judging simply by what's left on the surface, we started to think about eliminating sites as being contenders. The first one that was eliminated was the one that was all the way to the north, which was clearly the smallest in terms of, again, what we can see on the surface. We also eliminated the one that is farthest to the south for pretty much the same reason. Both of those were ballast piles. There was not a lot of other cultural material seen, and they were the two smallest of those five. This one we also eliminated because it is, um, again, small, but it's also so diffuse. Uh, we're not really sure whether some of the rocks to the south are geology or whether they're cultural. It's impossible to tell if a rock is cultural if it's not within a ballast pile. 
So, and there was also a very hard substrate, very uh, close to the, to the seabed floor under that particular site. And so I don't think there would be a lot of timber left if a ship had settled there. And that leaves two to consider. They're basically, uh, they're very similar in size, but we've also thought that, that the one that is uh, next to our favorite one, um, it, it does appear to be a bit smaller. It does not have as much timber, and it doesn't have quite as much of the uh, visual structure left as, as our other site. But it does have appropriate 18th century material, so we're quite confident that it is one of the transports. And that has left us with what we consider to be the best candidate that is the Endeavor. And that is a site that we've been working on for this particular field season. Um, we did a number of studies, very pleased with how this field season went. We were able to do some searching around areas that we still had not looked at to the south of these vessels to discount them. So we did not, as of this morning, did not find another site further south of our southern one. So that's actually good news. But we measured cannon on this site, we measured the timbers on this site, we've taken wood samples from a number of the timbers on this site. The wood samples could be key into understanding and identifying whether or not this, uh, this vessel is the Endeavor. There's also done um, some specialized 3D imaging. And at this point, I'm gonna turn you over to Dr. James Hunter of the Australian National Maritime Museum. He has spent much of this particular field season getting all of the images necessary to create this 3D model. So I'm very excited to see it because I haven't seen it yet. So I'm gonna come out there and join you guys and hopefully um, get a great image of the, this particular site. Thank you. I'm Dr. James Hunter. I'm with the Australian National Maritime Museum. And yes, I sound American, but that's because I was actually born in the U.S. I'm a dual national, and I'm very pleased to work at the NMM. Uh, I've been there for a few years now, and uh, I'm really having a great time working with them and with RIMAP. And I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about some of the work that I've been doing, uh, as well as some colleagues uh, from the Silent World Foundation and RIMAP, uh, to 3D model uh, the wreck sites. Now, uh, as has been pointed out a couple of times already, uh, we don't have the best visibility. And I think that's pretty evident if you look at the images here. Um, and that tends to be an issue. Uh, one of the things that is particularly useful for interpretive reasons, for an analysis, and also if you want to do an exhibition type thing, is it's really nice to have an image of the site in its entirety. And as you can imagine, when you're dealing with visibility that ranges around a meter, three feet, um, it's tough to do that. It's tough to see the whole site. You can see bits of it, but you can't see the whole thing. Thankfully, uh, there is a technology that has emerged in the past few years called 3D photogrammetry. And in a nutshell, what that is, is you have multiple images that you capture in digital format, you can take all of these images, you can put them into a software program that will find relationships among the images and it will make a composite. One big image from many, many, many small ones. And this would be a particularly useful thing because what we can do is we can show these rec sites in their entirety as they appear if you have some amazing visibility, which we don't have. So, um, again, Looking at this image, visibility on average that we're dealing with ranges between a meter or three feet to about three meters or nine feet. Sometimes it's significantly worse. It really depends on the tides, the currents, any one of a number of other factors that you can uh, bring in. So on many days when we were working, uh, this is what it looked like. You can't see the diver, but you can see their lights. Uh, and one of the things that we did was we carried a camera array with high-powered lights on there. And the reason that we did that was to try to illuminate the area that we were working in. Because we found that if you light it up really well, the colors really pop out. And those colors are incredibly important because you can use those to stitch the images together. Now here's an example. This is up at the north end of the site that Carrie has just spoken about. And uh, what you have are a few features of interest. Um, 
To your right, you'll see sort of a linear thing coming across diagonally. That's an electrical cable, uh, an old electrical cable that lays across the rec site. Now, just to the right of that, and it's not very easy to see, there's actually one of the wooden frames of the hull. Traveling across, you can see roughly in the middle of the image, that's actually one of our measuring tapes. So that gives you a sense of the accuracy of this. It will pick up that much detail. Continuing across, you can kind of see a slightly diagonal linear feature uh, kind of in the top right. That is one of the hull planks of the ship that is just sort of sticking out of the sand. And then sort of down to the lower left of that, there's a rectangular object that's just very faintly showing up above the silt, and that is one of the collapsed frames that's actually fallen out. So, um, from an interpretive standpoint, this is great. We actually know in this area, we have the delimits of the hull. We have one side, we have the other, and we also have a portion of the hull that appears to have collapsed out. So that's very good, that tells us quite a bit. Uh, here's another area, so this is down around the middle of the wreck. Uh, to your right, you see this sort of orangish shaped lump. That is actually the breach of one of the four cannons that is visible on the shipwreck. And a short distance away from that to the right, it's very hard to see, uh, or actually, sorry, your left, uh, is one, a couple of the frames of the hull timbers. Um, one of the issues that we have in working with this site is that the hull components particularly don't stick up very high above the seabed. There's very, very little relief. And the nice thing about this method is that because we're shooting multiple photographs and getting it from several different orientations, we pick up that three-dimensional aspect. So that if you turn the model, you can actually see that relief and the framing becomes better defined. Now this is one of the two cannons on the wreck site that are clearly visible. They stand proud of the seabed. Um, from my perspective, these were the best things to shoot because you could see them and you could get all around them and all over them and get really, really good imagery. Now, it may be a bit tough to see, but what we have here are three of the most prominently proud uh, framing timbers on the ship. Um, the scale bars that we have in there for reference, so there's one in the middle of those, and there's one to each side. So we have three of the frames there. And the nice thing about this technique as well is that if you get enough imagery and you get enough of an overlap, the accuracy improves so that you can actually derive measurements off of off this technique. And finally, this is, uh, or this is one of the uh, cannons down at the southern end of the site. So we have four. Um, two are proud, two are partially buried. So what we have here is in the lower left, you can kind of see this knob that's sort of sticking out of the silt there. That is uh, the muzzle of one of the cannons. And then roughly in the center of the image, you can see sort of a round uh, protuberance sticking up out of the silt. That is what's called the trunnion. Uh, there were two of these on either side of the cannon and that's what it was able to rest in the gun carriage on. So what we're in the process of doing now is trying to stitch all of this imagery together into that single composite image I was telling you about. Um, it's slow going, it's not easy. And to give you an example, on this project alone, we acquired 10,000 images. Um, the features have been fairly easy to model, because there's something very distinct there to see. By contrast, in areas where we don't have hull timbers, we don't have cannons, we don't have things sticking up above the seabed, it's a lot trickier because we're dealing with silt and we're dealing with muscle, shell, and not much else. So it's very hard for the camera and the program that we put the images into to stitch those images together. One of the ways that we've uh, tackled that issue is to put down targets. Uh, we call them targets. They're little square-shaped things. They've got a, um, each one of them has a unique geometric pattern on them. And so if you put them down and you take images enough that you've got two or three of them in each image, uh, it will see these patterns, it will recognize them, and it will use them to stitch the images together in post-processing. So we're, uh, we're working away at that right now, and uh, I suspect in due time uh, we'll have a complete site image of this wreck. Thank you.
Yes, now if you've got a moment, um, I figured I'd plug in the uh, our uh, computer and show you the 3D model if you'd like to see it. Uh, what I've shown you are still captures. All right. Uh, while he's setting that up, because it takes special software to do that, as you probably are aware, uh, I'd like to remind you that we'll be around if you want to do interviews later on. It's really a nice place to do the interviews because you can shoot over our shoulders and that's where we're working. But I'd also like to honor some people who are here tonight that if you would like to talk to other people about how we've been involved and how they've been involved and what they've been doing. Uh, the team this year was, I'm always first alphabetically, ABB is a great name. Uh, Steve Bastian was with us. Billy Burns, where are you? Bill? Okay. If you, if you want to talk to him about what it's like to work, John Cassess is here. John, where are you? There he is. Uh, Greg Diacentis is our, our research vessel commander. Andy Elvin is at one of our volunteer divers. He was actually tending to the Admiral yesterday. Uh, Kieran Hostie from the Australian National Maritime Museum. Where are you, Kieran? Uh, Carol Hottenrock, retired U.S. Navy, was our deck supervisor. James Hunter, of course, is there. <laughs> Carrie Lynch, you heard from her earlier. Uh, Irini Mal Maliaros, I keep pronouncing that wrong, uh, is from Silent World in Australia, and she had to leave early. And then, of course, Michael Noonan was on the, the team as well. We have board members here tonight. If you'd like to know more about RIMAP, Debbie Dwyer is here. Raise your hand, Debbie. Uh, Joy Elvin is here, Joy, uh, and we've got Tim Labonte is our documentary producer, and Leslie Sorensen. Is Leslie here? There she is. So if you'd like to talk to people about what it's like to work with us and get involved with us, they can tell you more about that as well. Are you ready? Yep. So James is going to continue. Yep. So uh, this is uh, one of the cannons that stands okay. proud of the seabed. And uh, again, it's nice because we have this in a 3D configuration. Um, one of the things that I'll show you, uh, and one of the things that's very nice about this program is it shows all of the shots that were used. So every one of these blue squares that you're seeing in the image is a single photograph that was taken uh, of the cannon. And I should point out that we don't always use every image that we get. Uh, and that's because some of them are blurry, some of them are dark, there's all sorts of different things that you have to factor in. So in post-processing we generally go through, we eliminate a certain number of images that we figure aren't going to make the cut, and then we put them into the program, and the program will actually select other images that it doesn't like either. So um, yeah, it's a great program, and uh, it's really nice because it it adds that extra added dimension uh, to, uh, to the wreck and its features. And from, a, uh, from an interp standpoint, from an analytical standpoint, and certainly from an exhibition standpoint, um, this is the sort of tools that you need. And I, and I think um, one of the things that's very nice about this too is that ultimately, uh, I think it would be great to have a virtual environment where people could visit this wreck. Uh, not everybody can dive. So to have an option that's available where people can see it as it appears, but not have to get in the water, uh, I think would be incredibly useful. Uh, I will close by saying I'd like to specifically thank uh, uh, Irene Maliaros from Silent World Foundation and John Cassese who uh, worked with me to do all this. Uh, they were the ones who uh, got in the water with me and uh, braved the, uh, the Merc to take all these photos. And uh, what you're seeing here is the sum total of their, their effort. So thanks a lot. You always forget to mention somebody when you rate a list like that, and I forgot the chairman of our board, Elliot Caldwell. <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> if you're going to forget somebody, that's not the one to forget. <laughs> um, I would like now to introduce to you Peter Dexter, who is chairman of the board of the Australian National Maritime Museum. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I would just like to begin by acknowledging Dr. Abbas, her chairman, the board, and the volunteers associated with RIMAP. Uh, this is an incredibly exciting sort of event. 
and I am extremely conscious of the fact that it's something that they have been working on since 1999 and to get to the stage that we are today is obviously one that's very important. I was asked to speak about what this might mean to the world. I'm not sufficiently presumptuous to try and talk about what this might mean to the world. I would like to though say what it might mean to Australians and I think it's very obvious through us having our Consul General in New York here, Alistair Walton, that we had the Chief of the Australian Navy here. But the fact that when this was first announced in Australia some 72 hours ago, that 19 million people have viewed the material that stemmed from that first announcement. Now Australia has a population of just under 26 million. So when you ask us what this means to us within Australia, it means an enormous amount. Um, I'm also delighted to be here with Kieran Hostie and James Hunter, my colleagues from the Australian National Maritime Museum. And again, when you think about what this means, I've said what it means to Australia. But Cook left England in 1769 in the Endeavour on a scientific voyage. The first objective of that voyage was to view the transit of Venus from Tahiti, which he successfully did. And then he came and found Terrace Australia, the lost continent. From there, it is the beginning of Australia's modern history. But so I pose the question to myself, what does Endeavour mean? You've heard today about Endeavour, where Endeavour voyaged to, but if you simply take that voyage into account, one of the greatest mariners in history was James Cook. He took Endeavour on this particular voyage. It came to Tahiti, it went on to New Zealand, it led to the claiming of Australia by England in 1770. He then went on to Indonesia and completed a circumnavigation of the world. So I think you can pose the question, where hasn't Endeavour been? She's been everywhere. So the work that has been done by RIMAP here is so important to so many people in the world and the Australian National Maritime Museum is extremely pleased to have contributed in a very significant way to the work that RIMAP is doing. We look forward to continuing to do so and we are extremely anxious that that validation takes place as soon as it possibly can. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Uh, I must remind you that these sites are closed to the public. Uh, there, there's no diving, no anchoring out in that area, which is now restricted by the Coastal Resources Management Council. That is to protect the sites, and I'm sure you will agree, if it is the endeavor, we don't want her damaged inappropriately. So please stay tuned, and we will share with you the next phase of what we're doing, and you're welcome to talk to anybody here about the project that we have identified as being part of RIMAP and part of the Australian National Maritime Museum. Thank you for coming.